Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Health Matters. Tonight we have our guest in studio is Dr. Yunus Umar, a dermatologist in private practice, a graduate of the University of Cape Town. Both his undergraduate and postgraduate studies were completed in Cape Town. He is a veteran in the field and he will be speaking to the 10 most common skin disorders. But before we begin, I will first start off with the terbiya as is customary. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Surah An-Nisa, pain receptors in skin. The ayah that showed Professor Tajasin the right path. Inna alladheena kafaru bi ayatina sofa nuslihim naron kullama nadijat Juluduhum baddalnahum juludan ghayroha liyadhukul adhaba inna allaha kana azizan hakima. As for those who disbelieve in our communications, we shall make them enter fire so oft as their skins are thoroughly burned. We will change them for other skins that they may taste the chastisement. Surely Allah is mighty wise. Maulana Shakir's Quran translation. Those who reject our signs, we shall soon cast into the fire as often as their skins are roasted through. We shall change them for fresh skins that they may taste the penalty for Allah is exalted in power wise. Yusuf Ali's Quran translation. Lo, those who disbelieve our revelations, <coughs> we shall expose them to the fire as often as their skins are consumed, we shall exchange them for fresh skins that they may taste the torment. Lo, Allah is ever mighty wise. Pictal's Quran translation. Though surely those who disbelieve in our signs, we shall certainly roast them at a fire as often as their skins are wholly burnt. We shall give them in exchange other skins that they may taste the chastisement. Surely God is Allah, Almighty, All-Wise. Pain receptors in skin. This verse indicates that there is something in the skin which makes us feel pain. This is exactly what modern science tells us, that is pain receptors responsible for, peeling, for feeling pain. It was thought that the sense of feeling and pain was dependent only on the brain. Recent discoveries, however, prove that there are pain receptors present in the skin without which a person would not be able to feel pain. When a doctor examines a patient suffering from burn injuries, he verifies the degree of burns by a pinprick. If the patient feels pain, the doctor is happy because it indicates that the, pain, the uh, patient is experiencing superficial burns and the pain receptors are intact. On the other hand, if the patient does not feel any pain, it indicates that it is a deep burn and the pain receptors have been destroyed. Professor Tajasin, chairman of the Department of Anatomy at a university in China, uh, in Thailand, has spent a great amount of time on research of pain receptors. Initially, he could not believe that the Quran mentioned the scientific, scientific fact 1400 years ago. He later verified the translation of this particular Quranic verse and was so impressed by the scientific accuracy of the Quranic verse that at the eighth Saudi medical conference held in Riyadh, on the scientific science of Quran and Sunnah, he proudly proclaimed in public, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger. Amin. Azim. We will now welcome Dr. Yunus Umar, our dermatologist in studio tonight, to talk about the 10 most common skin disorders. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Tonight I thought that we could uh, go uh, give an overview 
of some of the most common skin conditions that one encounters in practice. If we can have the first slide, uh, this will just enumerate the overview of our topic this evening. These <coughs> arguably are, are the 10 most common skin diseases. Uh, item number two, rosacea, actually should encapsulate acne with it. And uh, so there may be slight variations in different geogra geographic uh, locations in terms of the order, but uh, I think, by and large, this is a very representative uh, sample of the most common skin diseases. If we can start with the first uh, slide, <coughs> this is a, a typical uh, condition of what we refer to a, uh, commonly as shingles. Uh, the correct term for this condition is herpes zoster. And this usually occurs in the elderly and in immunocompromised individuals. Uh, also, it, it tends to affect mostly the trunk and the head. And uh, it's important to realize that uh, is, uh, th this lesion is quite painful. Um, and sometimes uh, the pain can actually uh, last for, for some time. So uh, shingles is actually uh, a very, very uh, important sign in terms of, of uh, skin pathology. Dr. Umar, you mentioned, uh, you, you said it's herpes zoster and shingles, and you also said that it occurs in patients that are immunocompromised. But we've also we also hear that patients that are uh, infected with HIV, this is also one of the manifestations of patients that are inflicted with the HIV virus. Correct. Yeah, because of the uh, the lowered uh, status, the immunocompromised status, then uh, uh, they are more likely to develop uh, more severe forms of herpes zoster, so-called uh, disseminated zoster, multi multi-dermatomal zoster, in other words, it occurs in different areas. But usually, uh, the, the, the herpes zoster in, 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 a, in a normal situation occurs in one, one or two dermatomes, but usually one dermatome. So from your slide, it appears like it looks like chicken pox, and it's, it's, it's the chicken pox family. Correct, correct, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, what happens is that uh, a person gets chicken pox in childhood, and the virus of chicken pox uh, lies dormant in the, uh, in the spinal cord. And then later on, uh, due to various factors, activation, uh, one gets uh, the dermatomal expression of the, herpes, uh, of, of the herpes zoster. Now the pain, I think I've heard a lot about pain in people that have suffered with shingles. They often talk about lingering pain long after the crusting and that is gone or any superficial evidence of the herpes zoster. Uh, is that uh, normal? Yeah, well, as, as you can understand that uh, this is, uh, the, the herpes is affecting the nerve, so there would be pain. And usually uh, the normal sort of history of the pain is that after it lasts up to about three months, but post-hepatic neuralgia, as it is referred to, uh, can last and there are some cases where it can last up to two years, and it's quite a severe pain. And what, what would your advice be to patients the moment they uh, uh, you know, find themselves in a situation where they're experiencing uh, skin erosions or eruptions? What I should they do? I think the important thing uh, with herpes zoster is that one should try and treat it as early as possible, because it has been found that if you start with the appropriate treatment early on, uh, and preferably within the first 24 hours, then uh, complications such as post-hepatic pain are much lessened, and also the severity of the uh, uh, eruption is much less. So that takes me to the next question. So what's the difference between herpes zoster and herpes simplex? Okay, if we can have the next slide, I think it should be a, an example of, there we are, yeah. 
This is a uh, herpes simplex, which is uh, due to the herpes simplex virus. It is characterized by this uh, vesicle, uh, which is painful usually. It has a tingling sensation. And uh, it usually occurs on the lips and around the mouth. Uh, it is a recurrent problem. And um, uh, basically, it, it is. Uh, it, it has a natural history of healing within about 7 to 14 days. So are you saying that without any kind of intervention, medical intervention, it could spontaneously heal? Oh yes, it's got a, a, a natural history of healing, but uh, sometimes it can cause a little bit of scarring as well. But uh, the, the important thing is that since it's a virus, there is no real cure for it, but uh, we can control the secondary infection uh, that can occur from uh, herpes simplex. So with herpes simplex, if I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying that it can recur from time to time. Correct. Uh, you know, recurrent herpes simplex, I mean, we don't talk about a cure. We talk about controlling it. And uh, th this is why it can recur. Uh, it's also commonly known as a cold sore, am I correct? Correct. Fever, blister, cold sore. Uh, and uh, it's a very, very common, common uh, uh, problem in, in practice. And we often find patients saying that they put on Vicks and uh, Zambuk and that. What is your response to that, Dr. Umar? Uh, no comment. No, sorry. <laughs> what I mean is that uh, they, they, there's no proof that any of that is going to really alter the, the history of the, of the herpes simplex. Uh, the main idea in, in, in treating the herpes simplex is to avoid secondary infection. and. Um, as I said, it's a, it's a virus, so it'll, it'll have to take its natural course. Okay. And on that note, we'll take a break. And when we return, we will continue with the 10 most common skin disorders. <music> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. Our guest in studio tonight is Dr. Yunus Umar, who is speaking to the 10 most common skin disorders. Dr. Umar, we ended off with herpes simplex, and we're moving on now to athlete's foot or fungus in the foot. Perhaps you can shed some light on that. Okay. Uh, if we could have the third slide that shows a picture of uh, the condition that we are going to talk about. Uh, no, I think it's the... Go back a bit, please. So while we're waiting right. for that, talking about the fungus in the foot, it's perhaps the you can speak a little bit about that. Right, there, there we, we are. Okay, so we're looking at a situation. This is a very common problem. Um, and now, uh, what causes athlete's foot? This is a, it's a, it's a fungus infection. And a typical distribution one can see on the sole, in, in, in between the toes, the so-called interdigital form. Uh, it can also affect the nails. And that is quite a, a, a resistant form in the sense that uh, treatment has to be prolonged for a long period of time. But uh, uh, this is, as I say, it's a very common problem uh, in, in, in practice. And, and how would one treat the athlete's foot? What is your advice to patients regarding athlete's foot? Well, obviously one has to make a diagnosis and sometimes one is uh, required to do a scraping of the skin uh, maybe uh, clippings of the nails and send it off to the laboratory for culture uh, and w because you're committed to, especially with the nail, you're committed to uh, a good few months of treatment, it's better to get a, a proper diagnosis because the treatment can be expensive. And um, so that, that would be the, the approach to, to the treatment. You can start with some topical creams as well as systemically with, uh, with some uh, systemic uh, tablets. And what is the advice to people to prevent uh, athlete's foot? Well, look, you know, usually these things happen in uh, uh, communal places such as gyms, uh, even the wudu kana at the mosques. Uh, one has to take precaution of, uh, uh, you know, keeping the feet dry uh, because the fungus uh, thrives in moisture. Uh, also, the, 
it's since uh, it is recommended that we we make wudu at home uh, this would help as well obviously if you're traveling through uh, you need to uh, make wudu at the mosque uh, then of course one has to be careful uh, make sure that you dry the feet uh, properly and uh, uh, you know this would uh, help in preventing a lot of the infections as well so what about walking barefoot or wearing socks what would you recommend well, obviously, walking barefoot is going to increase the chances of, uh, of an infection. Uh, so socks would be preferable, yeah. Okay. Um, the next skin condition? Uh, shall we move on to the next slide, please? Okay, this is a, s a picture just showing some common moles. Uh, this is a very, very common finding in most individuals. And uh, they are usually uh, of no real significance in the sense that there's no need to worry about these molds. Uh, most of the times they are removed for cosmetic uh, reasons. But however, one must remember that these molds can undergo certain changes and one has to be aware of that. Uh, you can, there is a chance of malignant transformation in some of them, and one has to be uh, careful and cautious. Uh, it is recommended that uh, patients with these moles get uh, examined at least once a year. And nowadays there's a, a equipment to, to actually record these uh, moles. Uh, the machine is referred to as a mole max. And what they, it's, it's a computerized uh, uh, thing where, where the moles are all recorded and then the patient is followed up uh, six monthly or yearly to see if there's any changes in the, in the, in the moles. So uh, what you're saying, uh, generally it's not a cause for concern, but it needs to be followed up if there yeah. are any changes detected. Absolutely. You know, certain things like sudden increase in size, uh, bleeding, crusting, uh, sudden increase in pigmentation, satellite formation, in other words, around the periphery of the mole, one gets a few little uh, satellites uh, of the mole. Uh, these are all suspicious signs, and a biopsy, a skin biopsy, would uh, be useful uh, to try and exclude any malignant transformation. Because one must remember that uh, uh, melanomas are, are, are very, very, uh, are actually deadly in, if not picked up and, and can, be, uh, can spread and cause uh, uh, severe uh, illness and so on. It can spread to the brain and to various organs. So it in the can body. be fatal, Dr. So Murray. the melanoma is, is a very, very serious condition, but obviously one has to uh, make sure that you prevent, prevent that uh, from occurring. Okay. Shall we carry on to the next one? Okay, this is a picture of uh, urticaria, also referred to as hives. And it's a very common problem. Uh, I'm sure most people pass through a phase of, of having hives at some stage in their lives. Uh, and it's an allergic response of the skin to various uh, stimuli and chemicals and drugs. Um, so, <coughs> in fact, you, you, you get two types of this condition, the so-called acute urticaria, which is uh, lasts for about six weeks or so, and then you get the chronic form. And uh, So in terms of urticaria, I've heard that it could be induced by stress as well. Absolutely, yeah. Wh one likes to first exclude all possible causes such as drugs and food and uh, infections and so on. But uh, there are definitely forms of urticaria which are aggravated uh, by stress, uh, referred to as psychogenic urticaria. And does urticaria recur? Absolutely, yeah. It, it rec it's a very recurrent problem. Sometimes it just resolves spontaneously and then recurs after a while. But generally speaking, uh, it's a recurrent problem. And uh, in the chronic form, which is the one that uh, lasts uh, beyond six weeks, one finds that uh, 
the, the causes are not so evident like the acute form and about 80% of the chronic form, you don't actually find an underlying cause. Okay, so, so it's about management. That's then. right, yeah. Can we see the next slide, please? This is a typical uh, clinical picture of psoriasis, where one gets these silvery, scaly, uh, red uh, plaques, uh, usually over the extensors like the knees and elbows. You can get scalp involvement as well as nail involvement. And uh, it's a chronic condition, and it, is, it, it has something to do with a uh, defect in the immune system. It can run in families as well. And we don't talk about cure, but we talk about control. So what are the measures of control that need to be uh, instituted? Well, there are various uh, modalities of treatment. We get uh, local treatment with various ointments. Uh, so one it's can topical. Topical, yeah. One can use uh, phototherapy. There's a uh, narrow band, UVB, uh, eczema, laser, and so on. So there are various options. Uh, also, there's a new range of medication called the biologics. Uh, they're extremely expensive, but also work extremely well uh, and have, of course, have side effects as well. But there, there are <coughs> there's a lot that can be done for psoriasis uh, and to keep it under good control. Uh, also, with psoriasis, you can get joint involvement uh, and they get a form of arthritis with the psoriasis. So uh, can we move on to the next slide? Okay, this is a baby with eczema of the face, of the cheeks especially, uh, referred to as atopic dermatitis. Uh, and <coughs> it uh, usually st uh, starts around three months of age and carries on during childhood. And it can even go on to adult adulthood. And it's related to uh, an, an allergic uh, problem uh, one usually finds uh, there's a concomitant uh, present of some allergy or some form of asthma or allergic rhinitis. So this is a triad of, uh, of the allergy. So is there a cure for eczema? Unfortunately, not a cure, but a good control, uh, especially you know, when the, the patients uh, develop secondary infection. And this uh, can be quite a problem uh, with crusting and bleeding and oozing and so on. So it's important to control this well <coughs> with a antibiotic, both systemic and topical, and uh, various uh, emollients and, of course, corticosteroid creams and so on. But there are many other creams on the market now that are non-cortisone-based, uh, and these are also very useful. And this is what you said, it's, it's a uh, hereditary condition, mostly hereditary. Correct, yeah. There's Are there isolated cases where there's, you know, it's not an, uh, a, a her uh, her inherited? Well, look, there's an aller a allergic background, as I mentioned, you know, asthma, hay fever, okay. eczema, and there's a family history family as well. History. Yeah. And on that note, we'll take an ad break and continue with health matters afterwards. Already, so quick. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters. For the view viewers that have just tuned in, we have Dr. Yunus Umar, a dermatologist in private practice whose focus is on the most common skin disorders. Dr. Umar, you've mentioned some of the skin disorders, and I wanted to ask you about liver spots, I mean, I the age spots. And and yeah. does it have anything to do with the liver? You know, has it any relationship to the liver, the age spot? If I can have the slide with the hand, uh, that's it. Yeah. Um, as you correctly state, this is referred to as liver spots. However, it has got nothing to do with the liver. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's also referred to as age spots. However, it's also it may be more common in the aged, but 
the underlying problem here is one of sun exposure. And that is why the other term for this condition is solar lentigenes. And uh, it's usually characterized by these brown spots uh, the on, the on the sun exposed areas of the hands. It can occur on the face, it can occur on the forehead and uh, the scalp. And uh, the important thing to remember is that these are not malignant, they are benign. So they are not cancerous as such. But um, it's important to use a sunscreen uh, and this would prevent uh, the spots from getting worse. But the, one can treat these with uh, various uh, modalities such as uh, superficial liquid nitrogen treatment uh, or even uh, lasers. So yes, that's what I was going to ask you. In terms of laser treatment, what would be the most appropriate laser uh, intervention? For yeah, for, for lentigenes you can use a laser. Yeah, it's, but it's yeah, are there there's different kinds of laser treatments? What, which one would you recommend? Yeah, look, you could use uh, you can use a fractal laser as well. It's not a problem. Uh, pigment pigmented laser as well, but uh, and it would if we're looking at olive skin. Asian skin, uh, in terms of any kind of further pigmentation uh, ca caused by the laser? Well, look, if, if you're looking at, uh, obviously there is a danger of uh, uh, post-laser hyperpigmentation, but uh, these days with the fractal lasers and uh, the lasers that are available, uh, one can uh, do very careful uh, treatment and, and this minimizes the, the pigmentation, especially with using of sunscreens and depigmenting agents. So it minimizes the pigmentation, minimizes risks as well? Correct. correct. So you would encourage patients to access that kind of uh, medical intervention? Oh yes, the, especially done in, in, in capable hands uh, and you know the, 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 the laser, the monitoring of, of the laser in Asian skin is quite important because you don't want to uh, cause any of the uh, post-inflammatory post hyperpigmentation. Can we have the next slide, please? <coughs> this is a very common condition in practice as well. Uh, it's referred to as skin tags, uh, and the uh, medical term is acrocordon. So it's a very common, uh, uh, common problem, in, especially in obese patients. Uh, this is associated with obesity. It is a completely benign condition. <coughs> and many times you, one just needs to snip them off or use a bit of liquid nitrogen to freeze them. Uh, and they, have no, they, they don't undergo any uh, malignant change. Are they contagious? No, no, these are not contagious. Unlike the, the, the warts that uh, people have, these are not contagious. So what you said obesity, so is this only, uh, does this occur only in patients uh, who, ha uh, who suffer well, from obesity or who are obese no, or no, are no, there no. isolated uh, cases no, no, uh, uh, in skin the general tags, population? Skin tags are very common, but what I'm saying is that they are more, <coughs> they are more f uh, prevalent in obese patients. So th the incidence is, is it's higher? It's much higher, yeah, that's right. Mm. And... Um, <coughs> Okay, so uh, can we uh, also, it's, it's common in diabetics as well. So and is it uh, painful to remove this uh, <coughs> skin tags? Not really, not really. They're very, very, uh, they're not themselves painful and, and the procedure itself is uh, it's a simple procedure of snipping them off. You could g give a little bit of local anesthetic if you wanted to. And also uh, one could use liquid nitrogen to freeze them as well. These skin tags, are they common, uh, most common in certain parts of the body or is it just generalized? <coughs> You're quite right. It's common, more common in the axillary area that is under the arms, uh, common on the neck especially. Uh, however, they can be, uh, these are the most common sites, but you can get them all over the body as well. Uh, shall we move on to the next slide? Okay, this is a, a condition, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, that uh, these two uh, were sort of related, the acne and the rosacea. But this is referred to as rosacea, where there's uh, 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 erythematous lesions on the face. 
Uh, it can be accompanied by acne-like lesions as well. And uh, this is a chronic condition. And uh, it's uh, characterized by recurrences. There is treatment available for this. So what are the contributory factors here uh, underlying rosacea? Well, look, uh, one, one has to, uh, basically, uh, emotional factors are involved as well. Uh, there's a, a problem with the vasculature of the face and uh, stress can actually aggravate rosacea as well. And does diet have a role to play? Absolutely, yeah. Things like uh, red wine, uh, spicy foods can aggravate the rosacea. Uh, any other drinks that could, uh, with uh, your MSG foods, monosodium glutamate? No, I'm not sure those are really the problem, but flushing and blushing is, is the, the characteristic uh, sort of uh, presentation. And uh, uh, the, the, the redness is also, and then sun exposure can obviously aggravate this. So <coughs> treatment would be, <coughs> excuse me, treatment would be directed towards uh, avoiding these factors. We mentioned the food factors. Uh, also, uh, sunscreens will be important in, in, uh, in managing this problem. So you mentioned sunscreen. Does that mean that patients who are s affected by rosacea should avoid the sun? Well, uh, if they wear a, a good sunscreen. Direct exposure to correct, the sun. Correct, yeah. And, but wearing a good sunscreen will help. And of course, wear, wear necessary to avoid unnecessary direct exposure to the sun. See, let's see if you got any other of those slides. There? So you're talking about rosacea, mm. which what is the difference between rosacea and acne vulgaris? Well, look, acne basically is a, it's a totally different situation. There we're talking about a hormonal uh, problem and uh, it's characterized by papules, pustules, uh, cyst formation and so on. So although they are uh, sort of spoken of as there's a condition called acne rosacea where you get acne form lesions in rosacea but the acne itself is a separate condition and the treatment well the treatment for for uh, for rosacea as I mentioned is sunscreens one can use antibiotics uh, one can use uh, topical uh, agents that uh, that can control the rosacea as well Whereas on the acne side, obviously, the, the, the treatment is totally different, uh, requiring systemic and topical antibiotics. And also now with the new, uh, well, not new, but uh, uh, for the more severe forms of acne, the cystic forms, there's uh, availability of things like uh, the, the Roaccutane and Oratane and those things, so those uh, medications. And they're very, very effective in controlling acne and preventing further scarring. Dr. Mar, looking at the age, uh, you know, if you're looking at the high-risk age cohort, is there a specific age cohort we are, which are more predisposed? In acne. In acne, yes. Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, you know, the, our last program, I think we discussed that in detail, but uh, uh, it's usually that in, in the teens, uh, one gets the adolescent acne, that is the commonest. You get rarely, you get infantile acne as well. And then you get acne in late, uh, uh, late onset acne as well, with uh, going on to middle age and so on. But the, the, um, the commonest uh, presentation is over, the t uh, over adolescence. OK, so interesting. You say that it, you know, th there's a cycle that it's prepubescent, postpubescent, and then uh, in the you know, premenstrual uh, phase as well, perimenopausal. Yeah, you can get it, as I say, the adult form, you can get that as well. And um, there are many other precipitating factors as well. Uh, certain drugs, for instance, patients on anti-TB drugs, uh, INH uh, and so on, can, uh, as a complication, develop acne lesions. So in terms of treatment, you know, if you're treating an adolescent and treating somebody in the perimenopause, how would the treatment differ? Well, look, in the adolescent form, I mean, one no normally starts off with uh, topical agents and uh, antibiotics by mouth systemically. Uh, in most cases, 
you can get good control with that treatment. However, as I explained to you earlier, when you have the severe cystic forms, then one would require uh, stronger measures such as the roaccutan, uh, the retinoids as they are referred to. Uh, these medications are not without side effects, so one has to be careful about their use. But uh, one can control it quite well now, uh, nowadays. And uh, uh, yeah, one could actually use the, the retinoids even in the elderly. So okay. that, that shouldn't be a problem. On that note, we'll take an ad break and continue with Health Matters. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Health Matters. We are in our last segment with Dr. Yunus Umar, a veteran dermatologist in private practice. We'll open the lines up for questions. The number to call is 11 086-7777. I repeat, 011-086-7777. Dr. Umar, we ended off with acne and I had some questions regarding the relationship between acne and lifestyle, more specifically related to diet. What is your response or take on that? Right. Look, there's various views on it, but uh, generally speaking, uh, diet by itself does not uh, really contribute uh, to, to acne. Having said that, one finds that certain, f if, if an individual finds that a certain foods uh, aggravate his condition or her condition, then they should just avoid those. But uh, scientifically speaking, uh, there's no hard evidence to relate the direct relationship between diet and acne. And uh, obviously, <coughs> eating a lot of junk foods and oily and greasy foods, uh, logically speaking, can aggravate acne. But uh, as I said, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a controversy about the exact relationship between diet and acne. So what you're saying, there's no empirical-based evidence to indicate that there's a causal relationship, a linear causal relationship. Absolutely. You see, because some individuals you'll find uh, have got beautiful skins and a terrible diet uh, in terms of their, uh, their uh, lifestyle of, of, uh, of eating. And uh, so it's not always, uh, you know, many, many patients will say, you know, I eat so well. Healthy. I eat so healthy. And yet my skin is so bad. And others would say, uh, you, 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 you'll ask another patient, uh, you know, do you take care of your diet? Say, Doctor, I eat everything and their skins are, you know, so they don't have any of these acne problems. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, although in some instances you get a direct relationship between a certain food and the acne, generally speaking, uh, uh, as I said, it's not, uh, there's no real causal relationship. But what you're saying, something important that you highlighted, you said, although it, there isn't a direct causal relationship, but in patients who are already affected by acne, uh, eating this kind of food Absolutely. could aggravate it. And Absolutely. I think that's important, something that they one should needs take to care. They should take appreciate. Care, yeah. We have true. a caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello? Hello? Okay, we'll continue. Uh, I, we, we, you talked about skin tags, you mentioned uh, warts whilst you were talking about skin tags. Yeah. Uh, perhaps you can just speak, uh, explain to us about the warts. What are warts and what causes warts? Well, look, uh, warts are very, very common, and there are very, many different uh, areas of the body where you get the warts. Uh, you can get warts on the hands. Uh, you can get them anywhere on the body. You can get them under the feet, so-called plantar warts. You can get warts on the face, which are flat-top warts, which we refer to as uh, verruca plana or juvenile warts. And all of these are caused by the wart virus. Uh, and uh, they are contagious. In other words, 
they can spread by contact and of course one can treat them there's, there's many modalities of treatment one can use a cauterizing machine one can use liquid nitrogen uh, and uh, even today there's the, there's new methods such as the candida injecting the candida antigen into the wart and this uh, creates an immune response so uh, uh, there are a lot of these warts uh, you find patients would say sometimes that uh, the warts just uh, disappear spontaneously. Okay, so there is spontaneous healing. Spontaneous, we have another yeah. call on the line, Dr. Umar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello? Hello? There seems to be a technical problem. I think we can continue until... Yeah. So we were talking about the warts, yeah, and... Um, you said about spontaneous healing. Correct, correct, yeah. And uh, in, in uh, patients who are immunocompromised, they can get, the warts can disseminate and you can get, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, dissemination of the warts throughout the body because of the lowered immunity. And of course, nowadays, one has the wart, uh, the wart uh, vaccine as well available. So this is quite important, yeah. So your advice to patients, when you talk about a wart vaccine, that, that sounds to me like prevention. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, especially for young girls, you know, you, you know the story about the cervical cancer and, and The human warts. papilloma virus. Correct, yeah. And therefore, uh, this is very recommended these days because uh, this would result in the prevention of, of any uh, problem leading towards cervical cancer eventually. So I think that's highly recommended for, for uh, certain categories of, of women. And, and I know that they are already, uh, they've already ins uh, instituted this program at schools at in, in Department of yeah, Education. I, yeah, I think uh, it's a little bit expensive at the moment, but I suppose if you really look at it, it's very cost effective in the long run. Doctor, any anything that you would like to advise the viewers on in terms of any of the skin conditions? Well, look, you know, uh, basically, uh, look, at the moment, people are preparing for Hajj, and uh, one finds that, uh, you know, you prepare so much for this journey, so much expense, and a simple thing like a fungal infection on the foot can actually cripple you, you know, in the sense that you won't be able to perform your hajj. And I imagine you're going through all. So it's so important to make sure that you wear proper uh, fitting shoes, uh, make sure that you don't have any slight uh, fungal infection at the moment, because once you get there and in the heat and so on, it can become really... Erupt. It mm -hmm. can erupt, you know, mm -hmm. and you can actually get infection and you, you, you won't be able to even walk. So that, that, that's very important. We have so another call on the line. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Hello. There's Hello. Something wrong with yeah, them. there seems to be a technical hitch. Hello. The other problem that if I can it's just carry on. It's not coming through. Yeah. Uh, you know, one finds that uh, people complain about the drying of the cr cracking of the heels and drying and so on and this can result in infection as well. So it's important to prepare well in terms of uh, looking after one's uh, feet. Care of the feet is very important in, in for that journey. And also while we are on the subject, <coughs> in uh, diabetic patients for instance, uh, it's very important to, to care for the feet. Uh, you don't want to have any problems there because obviously if things get out of hand, uh, it can result in things like gangrene and so on. So uh, it's very important that uh, patients with diabetes, and if they're going on Hajj, extra, s extra special care should be taken uh, in terms of uh, uh, looking after their feet and the caring of their feet and so on. <coughs> I noted you did not mention anything about sunscreen and p uh, going for Hajj. Oh, right, right, right. O obviously, sunscreens are very, very important. And, uh, you know, usually pe people are covered there, you know, in the, in the Islamic dress, but for the men especially. Uh, and, uh, I mean, this is recommended in all, all situations where there's sun exposure. Of course, there's uh, problems like heat stroke and things like that, which people have to be aware of as well. 
But there are lots of booklets out now on uh, the medical aspects of Hajj. And uh, it's recommended that people go through these booklets uh, and prepare themselves for the journey and also make sure that they, they, they take enough of their chronic medication because this is important in, in when you're away for a couple, uh, well, at least four to six weeks. And it's difficult to just get all your medication on that side during the Hajj time. I, I, would, I would presume it's better to take it from here. And uh, I know that, that, that to sprinkle the water on the face, uh, what would you recommend? Is that something that you would advise? Well, obviously in the heat and so on, yeah, it, it, would, be, uh, it would be refreshing, yeah, sure. Uh, but obviously s standing in the direct sun is a real problem. And uh, apart from the, the fact that you're going to burn yourself it, uh, in terms of heat stroke and so on. Okay, we're coming to the end of the program, Dr. Umar. We've got three more minutes before we uh, end the program. So just uh, please wrap up to, you know, your last few words. Okay, no, th what, what I just want to mention is that we've, we've got done, we've uh, went through 10 of the very common skin conditions, but obviously there's a whole host of uh, conditions that one could still uh, discuss. But uh, uh, just looking at the, uh, the, uh, the table there, one can see that a lot of these conditions are in fact preventable and uh, you know in terms of uh, prevention I think it's more important especially in, 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 in uh, some of these skin conditions sunscreen use uh, emollients for the eczema where you, you need to moisturize the skin regularly uh, <coughs> for the urticaria there's things like uh, preventing uh, in, in terms of the diet avoiding certain things avoiding certain medications for in terms of the moles uh, taking care of your uh, screening of the molds, uh, wearing a sun, uh, sunscreens as well, but in terms of screening of the molds, making sure that uh, where necessary one can go for uh, an opinion as to the, whether the molds <coughs> would need a biopsy uh, to check for early changes uh, of malignancy and so on. So uh, preventative aspects of, 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 uh, of dermatology are very important in this situation. So as the old uh, saying goes, prevention is definitely better than cure. Absolutely. Okay. And then on that note, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Umar Shukran Dalilan. I think the viewers would agree that it was very enlightening and most informative. And certainly the hints on what people should do when they go on Hajj uh, has been valuable information. Um, we will continue with Health Matters next week, but as is traditional, we will end with a recitation from the Holy Quran. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, bismillahir rahmanir rahim, wal asri inna al-insana lafi khus, illa al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. Sadaqallahu al-adheem. Shukran Dalilan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa